Hey there, so I did this in a message a few days ago, but I just want to solidify where we get the term filthy dreamers come. Why we say filthy dreamers. Um, are all dreams filthy? No, not at all. Some dreams are for God. They're manifestations of the spirit for the edification of the saints. And they're pure. Um, they, they bring illumination, revelation, insight, and even instructions about what's to come, like how to respond to the famine in Jerusalem, who, uh, how to go, like for example, the first open vision we see in the New Testament was Peter in Acts 10, before he went to Cornelius' house, and he had the vision of the sheet that came down and the animals in it, right? He said, rise and eat. He said, no, I've never touched anything unclean because he was a Jew. And God said, Who, don't call what I've called clean, unclean. And then you're going to go with these men to Cornelius. What is Cornelius? Cornelius is a Gentile. And Peter had a problem because he couldn't even imagine eating with Gentiles. And that produced a lot of problems in Jerusalem because he went to Cornelius' house, preached the gospel, they got saved, and then he ate with them. And when he came back to Jerusalem, the Jews in Jerusalem said, Wait a second, you ate with Gentiles? <laughs> they persecuted him. That persecution was actually very strong to the point that when Peter was in Antioch and Jews came from James, from Jerusalem, to Antioch, Peter shrank back for fear of them and wouldn't eat with the Gentiles. That's how strong that persecution was. So no wonder he needed such a strong vision but what was the vision? Did God say, say, Cornelius and the Gentiles are defiled? No. He said the opposite. Don't you call what I've called clean, unclean. So that is the example of a purifying dream for the purpose of edifying Peter, purifying his conscience so that he could be free to go and preach the gospel to the Gentiles. Up until that point, the Jews in Jerusalem didn't even believe that Gentiles could be saved, and that was 10 years into the church. <laughs> uh, it's a big deal. And he needed to be fortified. Edification has to do with purifying your conscience, okay, to stand in the presence of the Lord free from ordinances and anything that would bring you into bondage. That's the purpose of edification, to strengthen you in the Lord so that you stand strong. Um, now, the opposite of edification is defilement. What does defilement do? Defilement actually brings your conscience into uh, a stumbling place, okay, where you don't believe what God has called pure is pure. And that reminds me of the verse in Titus, you know, to the pure, all things are pure, but to the defiled and unbelieving, everything is impure. Their imaginations are pure. Their conscience is defiled. Their own imagination is defiled. And he was talking about uh, prophets from the Jews who said all Gentiles are just evil, slow bellies, you know. In other words, they make these sweeping generalizations about people and accuse them. And he says, look, you're defiled even in your conscience. The very fact that you accuse the Gentile believers of being evil shows that your conscience is not perfected. You are not edified. You're defiled. Okay? So, when we get to Jude, and he's talking about contending for the faith, um, he starts talking about false teachers and false prophets, right? Right? And what is he, this is where we see the word dreamers in the New Testament. It's the only reference to dreamers. Now, obviously there is dreams that God says he'll pour his spirit upon. You know, Peter had a vision. But dreamers are people that that's their whole thing. Dreams is their whole thing. They've become a dreamer. What is a dreamer? It's someone who dreams. Was Peter a dreamer or did he have a vision? He had a vision. Uh, Pontius Pilate, his wife, had a dream 
What was her dream? Well, God showed her that Christ was a just man and troubled her about what they were going to do to him. And she told Pontius Pilate, don't touch him. God showed me, I had dreams last night. That's a just man. What is that? That is an edifying dream to show that what people are calling defiled is actually clean. People were accusing Jesus, but he's actually without spot. That Jews called him an unclean spirit, but he's the spotless lamb of God and a just man. And God gave her a dream to that effect. Again, do you see the purifying uh, nature and the edifying nature of the dream from God? You don't see any dreams in the New Testament that accuse believers of not being believers. Okay, you don't. Though you don't see any dreams from God that call what God has called clean, unclean. That is a defiling thing. Again, to the pure, all things are pure. But to the defiled and unbelieving, even their conscience is defiled and their imaginations are impure. Nothing is pure. They accuse everybody of everything and they cannot approve of that which is excellent. Let your love abound yet more and more in all wisdom and discernment so that you may approve by testing the things which differ and are more excellent. The purpose of discernment is to be able to approve of that which is excellent so that you will be sincere and without offense in the day of Christ. Offense comes from your inability to approve of that which is excellent. You can't call clean what God has called clean. Why? Because your conscience is defiled. You are impure. Your imaginations are impure. That's what someone who is defiled is. And they're defiled with dead works and idols. They don't have Christ, they have Baal. They have the hard taskmaster, not the justifying propitiation who is our advocate. That's why they've gone the way of Cain. And they cannot recognize believers by their testimony. They overthrow God's word in order to accuse where God has justified. Uh, now Jude says... You know, there are certain men crept in and aware, right? And then he talks about the false teachers, and we're going to go to uh, verse 8. Likewise, these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, or these dreamers who are defiled, or these who are defiled by their dreams, okay? Their dreams defile them. They despise dominion. They speak evil of dignities, just again, despising dominion has to do with opposing the authority of the word. Okay? And speaking di evils of dignities, Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, dis when disputing about the body of Moses, dared not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, the Lord rebuked thee. In other words, he stayed under the authority, and he didn't call him names and cuss him out. He stayed in the spiritual uh way of warring, which is according to the Lord. The Lord is the one who does the work. I've got to hide in him. But these who, the dreamers, the defiled dreamers, who speak evil of dignities and despise dominion, what do they do? They speak evil, okay, which is, a comp which is the equivalent of the railing accusations that Michael wouldn't dare to even bring against Lucifer, the arch enemy of God's people. But these speak evil of things that they know not. Or they speak evil of things they don't understand. How? Through their dreams. Their dreams bring accusations against the saints. And I said, what is a dignity? You know, the least among the saints is going to judge angels. That's why Paul said in Corinthians, you know, if you have a matter, why you bring it before the Gentile judges? Don't you know the unrighteous aren't going to inherit the kingdom of God? Bring this matter before the least of the saints. The least esteemed among you is in a position to judge angels. That's why it's so serious, again, to judge what God has justified. You don't understand the, the heavenly position of a saint who is seated in the heavenlies in Christ and is justified by God. Who will lay a charge against those that God has justified. Not God, right? He's not condemning us. He's advocating for us. And any dream he gives us is going to bear witness with his uh, 
justification of his saints. Give me five minutes, okay? Um, all right. So he says, these speak evil of those things which they know not. In other words, they don't understand. Not only do they not understand the heavenly position of the saints that they are blaspheming and railing against and bringing evil accusations against, but they don't understand what they're talking about. And it's interesting because, you know, these dreamers that are accusing me of this and that, if you go over to Patrick L's wall, if you're familiar with my teachings, or if you go to Amanda's wall, or if you go to Kim Fisher's wall, or you go to Sherry's wall, you go to Lashara's wall, and you see them try to dissect my teaching, you will see that they clearly have no idea what I'm talking about because they can't even hold it in their mind. They are not able to even articulate what it is that I actually teach accurately before they bring their railing accusations against it. What does that mean? Well, they're speaking evil of things which they do not understand. Okay? But what they do natu know naturally, in other words, everything is according to their senses. And dreams are a sensory thing. They're not spiritual knowledge. Spiritual knowledge is the word. My word out of my mouth is like rain. It's purified seven times. It's like a hammer. But dreams come through the senses. They come through your mind. They, and, and they can come from God, but they're sensory. That's why it's called a vision, you know. Uh, they can also come from the Spirit, but they're manifesting your senses. But these have only sense knowledge. They don't have the knowledge of the Word. And what they talk about is they talk about what I teach as just dry, dead doctrine and head knowledge. And I've got no experience with Jesus and don't have a personal relationship with Jesus. And they talk about their dreams and all their experiences of how they get a hot feeling in their right hand before they teach or on the side of their face. And these phenomenalistic things might as well be angel feathers. Um, along with their dreams and supernatural experiences in the sense realm, that is what their knowledge of God consists of. Okay, and that's why he calls them what they know naturally by the senses, brute beasts. Now, somebody gave me the word brute, the word brute, I think, oh, I forgot what she said. Basically, it's to bring, it's again to bring more railing accusations against things you don't understand. Brutish in the Bible means you, you can't understand spiritual things. Okay, and beasts means that you're led by your senses and your nature. Your flesh is what leads you. Now, how do you know someone's led by the flesh? Because all they do is talk about themselves. Okay? All they do is vindicate themselves and their history before God and how spiritual they are and how much they love and how much grace they know. Every time they talk, they vindicate themselves. But Christ, uh, Paul said, we don't preach ourselves, but Christ and him crucified. I'm determined to know nothing about you, among you, except Christ and him crucified. And if I speak of my history, I speak of my foolishness. If I speak of my righteousness, I'm speaking of dung. I count it all as lost to the excellency of the knowledge of Christ. I want to be found in him. Almost done, Ian. <laughs> okay, but these speak evil of things they do not know, right? And uh, what they know naturally as brute beasts in those things they corrupt themselves. Woe to them. For they have gone the way of Cain. What is the way of Cain? It is to deny people who are covered by the blood as being sons of God. They deny the testimony. That's what 1 John tells us about the way of Cain. Cain hated Abel because Abel's deed of offering blood was righteous. And he rejected it. He's like, no, you've got to offer something for the fruit of the ground. I've toiled. Look what I've offered. And the ground was cursed just like our flesh is cursed people who are enemies of the cross and take the way of cain want righteousness according to the flesh and they can't see that their flesh was consigned to the cross that's why they'll teach oh no uh my outer man is actually being cultivated my outer man is being transformed when clearly the bible tells us that our outer man has been consigned to the cross and is being consumed the outer man has to be destroyed. That's what transfiguration will ultimately be. We'll be clothed with a new body. Because this body has the law of sin in it, and it has to go to the death. They will not admit that. Because they want to bring 
The fruit of the cursed ground to God is an offering. And they boast in it. That's what it means that they glory in their shame. Enemies of the cross are led by their appetites and boast in their shame. They glory in their shame. What is their shame? Their shame is their flesh, which they're trying to offer up to God like Cain did. And meanwhile, they're saying, no, I refuse to recognize Abel as one who's born of God, who has the testimony. I refuse to recognize that as his righteousness. You've got to have more than a profession. That's just head faith. That's just mind. That's just intellectual knowledge and not really believing with your heart. I can tell because you don't have the fruit that I'm bringing. Okay. And then they ran greedily after the heir of Balaam for reward. Again, either money or the praise of men. And to run after the heir of Balaam is to put a stumbling block in front of God's people and teach them to worship idols, to go after Baal, to go after the senses and take away their present enjoyment of Christ and substitute it for the promise of a tomorrow Christ, right? Which is Baal. Uh, that turns out to be a false Christ who's actually judging you and condemning you, not bearing witness that you're a child of God. And then finally, perishing in the gainsaying of Korah. Korah opposed the authority of the word in the wilderness and said, who are you to tell us? Okay. So are dreams bad? No, dreams can come from the Lord, but they're edifying. They bear witness to his testimony. The word of prophecy, the prophetic gift should bear witness with the testimony of Christ concerning his person and his work and will cover... Every person who's justified by faith in the blood, never bringing accusation against them, especially railing accusations and evil speech. So he says, these are spots in your feasts of charity. When they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear, they have no conscience that regulates them. And they're able to say anything about others because they do it on the authority of their dreams and say, God's actually the one showing them. They're clouds without water carried about by winds, trees whose fruit withers. Now fruit, we have fruit. It's the fruit of the Spirit. But when pressure comes, what comes out? Whining and complaining, murmuring and fault finding, seeking people to pity them, and then begging for money. <laughs> okay? Uh, they're going to have to repent. And Enoch's also the seventh from Adam prophesied of these. What? Of these dreamers and complainers. Behold, the Lord comes with 10,000 of his saints to execute judgment against those and convict those who are ungodly among them. Of their ungodly deeds and which they've ungodly committed and their hard speeches, which ungodly sinners have spoken against them. They are murmurs, complainers, Walking after their own lust, their mouth speaks great swelling words, having men's person in admiration because of advantage. What does that mean? You flatter people to gain a position. You hook up with the people you think are going to give you a spot. That's not fellowship. The fellowship is the feast. That's spots on the feast. They're not in here by the fellowship of Christ, the unleavened bread. They're in the leavened fellowship so-called of false love and flattery and idolatry but remember the words which are spoken before how they told you there'd be mockers in the last time who'd walk after the ungodly lusts they separate themselves sensual not having the spirit now they boast of having the spirit they boast a great deal about their gifts right but he says they're sensual their manifestations that they trust in are actually all in the realm of the senses and they reject sound doctrine. They reject the word of the truth. They hate it. They oppose it. That's what Korah is. But you, in contrast, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keeping yourselves in the love of God and looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Okay. I did get going. My kid needs me. But that's where we get the term filthy dreamers. And if someone just gets all upset because I said dreams are filthy, that's not true. The, the point is the character of the dreams. Are they assassinating and slandering the saints or are they edifying? Manifestations of the spirit in the body are for the edification of the body. And they don't call what God has called pure, impure. 
They do. They defile those who have the dreams. You know, they're defiled by dreams. There's supposedly 50 plus women who've had sexual dark dreams about me of an evil nature. And somebody said, oh man, I need to have a YouTube channel. No, it's not fun. Uh, it, they're defiled by their dreams, not me. See, people say, well, he's evil because these people had dreams. No, these people are defiled by their dreams and they need to cast those dreams off and repent. <laughs> And if you don't see that, then you're serving Baal. Period. Ugh. Okay. God bless you all. In the name of Jesus, I speak protection over this ministry, over the hearers. I say no weapon formed against us will prosper. Every tongue that rises against me in judgment and us in judgment, we condemn not by our own authority, but by the name of Jesus and the blood. We thank you, Father, that we are under your blood and covered. We thank you that you have spoiled the principalities and powers and you blotted out the ordinances that were against us. You've crucified us, you've cleansed us with the blood, and you have justified us, and you are our advocate. Father, in the name of Jesus, we submit ourselves to you humbly and ask you to be our protector and our armor and help us to stand in the evil day and to speak the word boldly and not be afraid of our adversaries and yet not also respond in the flesh with railing accusations, but to simply speak the truth and let you deal with the results. Lord, I pray for these people that they would be brought into repentance, especially the ones that are genuinely saved. Only you know, Lord. Uh, when people corrupt the gospel, Lord, it's hard for us to tell, but you know those who are yours. Let those who are yours depart from iniquity. Lord, I pray blessing on our enemies in the name of Jesus, and I release them to you, and I ask you, that you'd bring people to repentance and that you'd bring people to the knowledge of the truth so that we can go home. Do not let, we thank you that no one will slip from your hand. We thank you that those who are caught in this spirit of uh, seductive idolatry will be freed from it in the name of Jesus. And I ask every subscriber on my channel to agree with me in prayer right now for the names that I've mentioned in this video that they'd be released from bondage and be brought into the fellowship with the saints. That there wouldn't be a false unity and that the division would be healed, but not by a false unity, rather by genuine repentance and to the acknowledgement of the truth. And Lord, I just pray you cleanse us of all defilement with your word and with your blood. In Jesus' name.